A solitary mass sits in empty space. Very far out from it, we release a ring of neutral particles, followed shortly thereafter by another ring, and then another. If we repeat this process in a continuous fashion, we will soon have a sea of particles flowing faster and faster inwards towards the mass. What would you say this is a picture of, exactly? A large number of particles all subject to an inwardly attractive force? Well, what if it weren't these particles which were moving at all, but rather space itself that was truly flowing, sweeping the particles, other masses, and even light along with it? This is dialect with the river model of general relativity. When is an analogy merely a tool for comprehension, and when is it something more? Indeed, there's an analogy in general relativity that asks us to imagine space to be like a river, a sort of flowing background against which all matter is swept into sinks of mass and energy. At first glance, this may not strike you as a great analogy. How the heck can an abstract construct like space flow into itself? What would such a statement even mean? But when we start to peel back the layers to this analogy, we'll find there's something highly suggestive going on. Okay, but first, where does such an analogy even come from? Well, start by imagining that you're on a rocket ship blasting through outer space. Next, imagine dropping a loose object off of yourself. That object will fall to the floor. Of course, the object didn't really fall. The second you released it, it stopped accelerating and began traveling at a constant velocity. While the rocket ship continued accelerating up to meet it. Now, rather than a single object, imagine you released a set of tiny particles in the shape of a grid. In the same manner as before, this grid will also fall to the ground. This grid, of course, is a stand-in for our traditional conception of space. So, if we're accelerating, we can make a sort of funny-sounding statement about space. That is, we can say space is flowing past us, getting sucked into the rocket ship floor as though that floor were a sink or drain. Loose objects floating on the current of this space likewise get carried towards the floor. And even a light beam itself will arc downwards, as if with the current. Of course, if we weren't accelerating, but rather were at rest or traveling at constant velocity, we wouldn't be able to make such a statement, because our space grid would simply stay put. Now, if you're familiar with general relativity at all, you know there's another kind of statement we can make about being in an accelerating rocket ship. We can claim that we perceive ourselves to be in the presence of a homogeneous gravitational field. This is the equivalence principle. By flipping it around, we can also claim that any frame in which we perceive a gravitational field can likewise be treated as accelerating meaning we can make the same funny assertion about being in a gravitational field that we did about being in an accelerating rocket ship. That is, we can say that space itself is flowing past us, getting sucked no longer into the floor, but rather into the mass or source of the field. Now, the primary place we perceive a gravitational field is at the surface of the Earth. Okay, but this is just a clever analogy. Space isn't really flowing into the Earth, is it? Well, now comes the incredible fact that you aren't actually at rest on the surface of the Earth. The ground is, in fact, accelerating you upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared through space. 
If you drop an object off of yourself, it falls to the ground for the same reason it did in the accelerating rocket ship. Because the ground rushed up to meet it. If you're skeptical of this fact, you can prove it to yourself by stepping off of a tall building. We said by stepping off of a tall building. There we go. Now, this action will cause the gravitational field in your immediate vicinity to vanish before any light signal has a chance to reach it. This is a violation of causality. For in a true force field, such as the electromagnetic one, any disturbance to the field can only propagate at the speed of light. This fact, in conjunction with an empirical inability to measure the field you are supposedly falling in, forces you to conclude that the field you perceived the moment before you stepped off the building was indeed a fictitious one. And that implies that it must be the ground which is accelerating, not you. But this incredible fact immediately raises a whole host of other questions. How can one part of the Earth's surface be accelerating upwards, while miles away another part is also accelerating upwards, but in a slightly different direction? And meanwhile, at the antipodal end of the planet, that same surface is somehow accelerating in the completely opposite direction. It becomes even more mind-boggling when you realize that, even though the Earth is hurtling apart in every direction, it somehow remains stationary with respect to itself, even though there is no force acting to pull it together. But this is where the idea that space is flowing becomes something more than just an explanatory analogy. To answer the question of how we can all be accelerating and yet all remain in place, it becomes useful to reinterpret gravity not as a force that acts on matter, but rather as a force that acts on space itself, causing it to rush and flow in towards sinks of mass and energy. Remaining stationary with respect to a mass means different observers will have to accelerate in different directions and with different strengths in order to overcome this flow or rush. To make this clearer, imagine that you are motorboating along a river near a waterfall. The closer you get to the waterfall, the faster and faster the current begins to rush. Now, if you want to stay stationary with respect to the shore, you'd have to fire up your motors and start accelerating. This acceleration wouldn't need to be very great if you were far out from the waterfall's edge. But as you got closer, the increase in current will precipitate a greater and greater acceleration of your boat relative to the shore. Meaning you are required to run your motors harder and harder in order to stay put. Indeed, within a certain distance of the waterfall's edge, you may not be able to accelerate hard enough to overcome the current, and you'll be swept over. Meanwhile, if you simply drifted along with the current, you wouldn't feel any force on your boat at all, even though you're clearly accelerating relative to the shore. You would, however, feel a tidal pressure stretching your boat apart, since the downstream end of your boat would be getting pulled towards the waterfall faster than the upstream end. This tidal gradient also means that other boats drifting along with you will steadily see their distance with respect to you increase over time. Now, instead of a linear river, let's imagine a large flat basin of water which is draining through a single hole in the middle. In this setup, boats will have to accelerate, not only with different strengths, but also in different directions if they want to remain stationary with respect to the basin. Boats that aren't accelerating, but just drifting with the current, will now experience tidal pressures not only in the radial direction, but also in the tangential direction, 
as water rushing in from all sides towards the drain will act to squeeze the boat inwards. This will also cause boats that are drifting along adjacent radial avenues to see their respective separations steadily shrink over time. Of course, in this visual, the basin is relatively small and drains fast, so these tidal effects will be very brief and very strong. But a different picture might invoke a very large, very shallow body of water draining through a comparatively small outlet, something like a 360-degree river which was headed towards a waterfall in every direction. Indeed, in such a situation, the supply of water would be endless enough, and the accumulation of tidal forces subtle enough that an observer accelerating in place might not notice the motion of the river at all, and rather think that objects floating on it were being attracted inwards by a radial force field that fell off with distance. Now, these pictures essentially sum up how gravitation as modeled by flowing space works. To see this, let's start at the model of the classic gravitational field, where we have vectors drawn in for the strength and direction of the field at every point. Thanks to the equivalence principle, we can now take every one of these vectors and flip it around to find the respective strength and direction of acceleration that an observer located there would need to exert in order to remain stationary with respect to the central mass. From our earlier considerations, we know that this means for each tiny area in the region, we can say space is flowing past our observer there. Just as on the spaceship before, we'll let grids fall in these areas to give us a general idea of how much speed the current of space is picking up at each location. Now, if we drop neutral particles from a far distance, the velocity of these particles will be boosted as they cross over from one tiny area to the next. This produces the so-called river of space, which rushes faster and faster as it nears the central mass. Of course, the true river of space is three-dimensional. But for ease of both the visuals and the analogy, we're going to stick to two dimensions. Now, this river resembles our physical rivers from earlier. And indeed, between these various pictures, we can observe many similar phenomena. The downstream end of space rushing ahead faster than the upstream end, for instance, gives rise to tidal forces that cause radially aligned inertial observers to drift apart. Similarly, space rushing in from all sides causes those same observers, if they occupy different radial avenues, to drift closer together. For something such as a grid of neutral particles, the total tidal deformation produced upon it by the flow of space will be the same as the deformation produced upon a grid of, say, rubber duckies by the flow of our 360-degree river. But the most powerful aspect of the river picture is furnished by the simple intuition that any matter within this river will be subject to its movement and flow, just as how objects caught on the current of an actual river are subject to its flow. This idea applies to even light itself. Yes, light always travels through space in a straight line at 300,000 kilometers per second. But as we saw earlier on the rocket ship, that space can itself be in motion. And indeed, close enough to a spherical mass, the converging flow of the river indicates space is likewise converging in every direction resulting in the deflection or bending of the trajectory of that light beam as it passes by. Now, by the time the river of space reaches us at the surface of the Earth, it will have obtained to a velocity of approximately 11,000 meters per second. In classical physics, this value is known as our planet's escape velocity. But in the river model, it's the velocity at which you are traveling through space.
Indeed, your continual acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared at the surface of the Earth ensures that you are always traveling through the river of space at this velocity. Similar to how accelerating in place in a river ensures that you are always traveling the same speed over the water. Now at last we can understand how the Earth can be accelerating outwards in every direction at once and yet remain stationary. Every point of its surface is merely fighting against a different inflow of space. This also explains why the Earth's surface is accelerating in the first place. If we imagine a bunch of boats in our basin, all getting stuck together atop the drainage point, they will be forced to accelerate over the inrushing water due to their mutual blockage. Likewise, we can view the mass of the Earth as being all jammed up over the inflow point of space, forcing a radially outwards acceleration across all parts of the mass. Lastly, just as there comes a point in our physical river where the current becomes so strong we won't be able to run our motors hard enough to overcome it, there comes a point where the current of space becomes so overpowering that no amount of acceleration will negate it. This is the event horizon of a black hole, or the place where the river of space reaches the speed of light. To observers outside this horizon, here at this location, the inward rush of space exactly matches the outward movement of light, making it appear as though that light itself were frozen in place and that time had ground to a halt. Infalling observers, meanwhile, are transported to a realm where space is now traveling possibly faster than the speed of light. Technically, if we don't want to think of space as having a single preferred speed, we should rather say that, at the event horizon of a black hole, observers are being boosted by an amount equal to the speed of light. Of course, thanks to the special additive properties of velocities in special relativity, any velocity that is boosted by the speed of light simply becomes equal to the speed of light. So indeed, at the event horizon of a black hole, all and every possible conception of space is traveling there at the speed of light. This is indeed like approaching a massive current gradient in a river, a place where, over a very short distance, the speed of the water and all objects on it will increase drastically. In other words, a black hole is to space what a waterfall is to a river. How far can an analogy take us? Obviously, the comparison of space to a physical river breaks down at numerous points and is only intended to be illustrative. But the concept of flowing space, on the other hand, can be made formally precise via the use of the goldstrand pon le bay metric. Moreover, it can be extended to other metrics to help us describe rotating black holes and more. But is all this just an illustrative way of interpreting space-time curvature, or is there a deeper underlying connection? Indeed, how is all this supposed to relate to the warping of space and time? Well, our journey down this particular river has only just begun. So climb aboard now, because boy, revelations are coming. This has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.